good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So very briefly, in a few slides, I will try to summarize what, uh, what you have to know and what we know now regarding uh, critical care ultrasonography. First of all, I, I want to tell you uh, that it's a very long academic process uh, which started uh, 10 years ago. And uh, the first paper that you may uh, know is this uh, statement that we did uh, with the American College of Chess Physicians. And you can see that in this uh, statement, we defined what is uh, general uh, critical care ultrasonography. And you can see that it may uh, include lung, pleural, abdominal, and also vascular uh, critical care ultrasonography. But in the same document, we also defined what is uh, uh, critical care echocardiography. And uh, you can see now that we uh, decided to split this uh, aspect in two different levels, the basic level and the advanced level. And you have just to know that uh, either for the general critical care ultrasonography or for the uh, uh, critical care echocardiography, the uh, main uh, principle is that this is the intensivist uh, which is doing it himself the uh, examination at the bedside. So you need to have your own machine in the unit if uh, uh, possible. So just uh, uh, later on, uh, a statement regarding the, the training requirement to uh, become competent in general critical care ultrasonography and in uh, critical care echocardiography at the basic level. So the basic level is something that you may read also in the literature, which is called uh, goal-directed echo. So it's a very quick and focused uh, examination uh, regarding the heart function. And you know that we decided with some experts that uh, you have to uh, do a 10 hours course uh, for each uh, part, for this one and for this one. Uh, 30 fully uh, supervised transthoracic echo for the basic critical care echo. There was absolutely no consensus regarding the number of supervised uh, general ultrasonography that you have to do uh, before uh, becoming competent. Very important uh, thing that uh, we decided that uh, it has to be included into the curriculum of all the intensivists. It means that you do not uh, require, uh, you do not need, sorry, any certification, any diploma. This is the same uh, process that you do when you are trained during your training process to intubate a patient or to perform dialysis. This is exactly the same, uh, the same process. For the advanced critical care echo, this is a little bit different be because now it's absolutely not basic. It just uh, focuses on hemodynamic monitoring. You know that the uh, training uh, level is much higher, uh, 40 hours a course. 100 fully uh, supervised transthoracic echo, uh, 35 fully supervised transesophageal echo, and in this uh, uh, level you need uh, to uh, obtain a certification or a diploma, and that will give, uh, give you some information regarding the European diploma later on. So just uh, here you have uh, in the last document the respective uh, uh, advantage or disadvantages of the transthoracic and transesophageal approach. And you can see that, for instance, the transthoracic echo is completely non-invasive. The probe is very easy to clean. And you have uh, many uh, interesting aspects regarding the use of the uh, ultrasound beam uh, to uh, analyze the flow, the blood flow uh, across the different valves because you are in a good alignment. But uh, in the same time, the main disadvantage of the transthoracic approach is that uh, um <coughs> it's not your usual knowledge, but you need to be uh, strongly trained to become competent because, because in, uh, the, in uh, the ICU, because patients are uh, very frequently difficult to evaluate using the transthoracic approach because of drains, because of high PEEP, because of fluid overload, and so on. And so this is much more operator dependent probably than the T approach. So at the opposite, the advantage of the T approach is that this is uh, less operator dependent. It's probably much easier uh, to uh, become competent for a full hemodynamic evaluation because it's very easy in a few uh, examinations to um, um, obtain the uh, adequate views. You can see that uh, on the opposite, this is not completely uh, non-invasive. This is minimally invasive because you have to insert a T probe. 
and you have to uh, organize your own system in your unit to clean the probe, not to wait for a long time before to re-utilize uh, um, the probe if you need uh, to do an echo in another patient. So ju just to show you that uh, uh, why this kind of uh, competency of uh, uh, supervised uh, TE to obtain the competency, it is because we, uh, in a, we using our uh, trainees in our unit, we built a scoring system just to evaluate the ability of uh, our uh, um, uh, physician in, uh, in training, uh, their ability to accurately monitor hemodynamics using the TE. And using this scoring system, we uh, wanted to evaluate at which level they uh, will uh, become competent. And you can see here that uh, the uh, best compromise between the sensitivity and the specificity to become competent was 25 supervised TEE during six months. But we decided that we need absolutely to have a specificity of 100 to be sure that people are actually competent. And you can see to obtain this uh, 100 specificity, we demonstrated that we had uh, people attend the, uh, our uh, physician had to perform at least 31 T studies at the bedside to uh, evaluate uh, hemodynamics. This is uh, the first part. The second part, and not the third, sorry, is that we start to have some data and some studies uh, based on the echo evaluation in the critical yield. So I will show you uh, some. The first one uh, was published in Journal of Critical Care. They just randomized the uh, patient in, sh in shock, whatever the cause of shock, I mean septic shock, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, in two groups, 110 patients in a limited echo group, which is once again the goal-directed echo, so very focused examination to decide how to manage the patient, and the STODA group, which is the usual uh, practice in this unit, 110 patients. And you can see here, that uh, they uh, demonstrated some decrease in survival, improve in survival, sorry, in the uh, interventional group, 66% compared to 56. You can see that uh, they uh, did not demonstrate some uh, uh, decrease of uh, patient free of uh, renal replacement, but you can see that it is interesting that in the uh, limited echo group, they've demonstrated or they reported a decrease in the uh, percentage of patients with AKI, so acute kidney injury, whatever the severity. The second study that you may have uh, in the literature regards now uh, a population uh, admitted for septic shock. Once again, this is a small uh, study, uh, more a pilot study. You can see a randomization, 30 patients in the control group and 30 patients in the uh, preload uh, dependency evaluation group based on the echo evaluation. And I don't want to comment too much the, the, the algorithm in the two groups, but you can see that in the, the control group, this is mainly based on the CVP as recommended by the surviving sepsis campaign. Whereas, <coughs> sorry, in the echo group, we can say in the echo group, this is mainly based on the uh, pulse pressure variations, but also uh, to uh, demonstrate if the patient uh, has any acute carpulmonale or, or some um, uh, left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And just to show you here, the control in blue, the interventional group in red, that's interesting regarding the fluids, because you can see that the interventional groups allowed the physician to uh, give less fluids in the less severe patients, and more fluids in the more severe patients according to the SEPS2 uh, uh, index. So a, a good uh, adaptation of uh, a requirement of fluids uh, according to the severity. And uh, that's a pity because now on this uh, kaplan meyer curve, the control group is in red and the interventional gr uh, group is in blue, so this is the opposite. Uh, th than here, but you can see that in the interventional group they observed a, a, a slight uh, uh, improvement in survival, although, although non significant, but once again only 30 patients in each group, so a very, very pre preliminary study. The third study, not yet published, but uh, will be shown uh, in the intensive care medicine as 7 day profile, 
is the uh, data that we report in uh, more than 700 ARDS patients uh, submitted to protective mechanical ventilation. And just to show you, for instance, the different factors which are reported uh, to be associated with prognosis in this study. And you can see that especially uh, the uh, occurrence of a severe acute corpulmonale, so some very uh, significant triventricular failure in this patient was associated with poor prognosis. So what is the future, uh, briefly, to, to conclude my presentation? So the future maybe uh, could regard this kind of uh, small probes. You know that there is one here, and I will show you another one later on. It could uh, uh, be left in place into the patient during three days. And so this is a TE probe. It may help you to monitor the hemodynamics and to do and redo and do again an, an eco-evaluation if the patient requires of some hemodynamic evaluation without reinserting the, uh, the probe. You have the main views that you may observe by the TE approach. You have another one that you cannot uh, leave in place into the patient, but very small one. You cannot leave this probe during a few days, but you can maybe leave this probe during a, a few hours during some uh, treatment uh, optimization as fluid expansion or during the butamine uh, infusion just to uh, check what happens in terms of cardiac function and hemodynamic optimization. You know that maybe uh, you know very well this, uh, this kind of uh, pitch uh, of a device now. I don't know, Daniel, maybe uh, uh, will do a comment if it is really uh, adapted for lung or plural uh, ultrasonography, but it has been demonstrated to be adapted for uh, focus and goal-directed echo at the bedside using the stethoscope you have also in the other pocket, this kind of pocket machine, and it may help you to uh, evaluate the cardiac function at the bedside. In the, it was uh, reported in the ICU, but also in the emergency uh, room, and also in uh, pre-hospital uh, emergencies in the ambulance. So uh, just uh, to conclude, just a, a, a few words regarding the, the, the future regarding the certification, because I told you that if you want to become competent for advanced critical care ECHO, for instance, you absolutely need to validate a diploma or certification. And there are many countries in Europe where there is nothing, or at least nothing. In France, we are lucky because we have uh, some uh, certification dedicated for intensivists and for critical care echo. But in many other countries, I think that in UK there are, there are some, but in many countries you have nothing and there is a big, big demand uh, in Europe for this kind of, um, of certification process. And so probably that in the very, very next uh, future, uh, before the end of uh, 2015, we will be able to uh, officially create, under the supervision of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, the EDEC, which is the European Diploma for Echocardiography. It, it was not my last slide. <laughs> I, I forget that uh, there is at least uh, uh, one more. Just to, to show you that uh, that wonderful, we did a very big job. We are very exciting how we uh, push uh, strongly the use of echocardiography in our ICU uh, uh, for the benefit of the patients. But I just want to, to show you this uh, little bit disappointed study, which is not uh, really a study, but a survey. This is the Finiche survey, which was published in Intensive Care Medicine. So you can see, uh, sorry, you can see that this survey included more than 2,000 patients in more than 300 centers across more than 40 countries. So a very good picture at one uh, time of uh, the usual practice regarding the fluid uh, uh, management in the critically ill patients. And you can see here you have the, um, the main hemodynamic variables which was used in this survey by the physician to manage the, the need for fluids. And just to show you that uh, the echo variables were very, very, very rarely used, only 2% of the patients. So I think that we need uh, more and more uh, studies regarding the use of echo in the ICU, and especially probably some randomized control trial that we do not have at that time to convince our colleagues to use this uh, wonderful technique 
to optimize the managing of our patients. Thank you for your attention.